Hey, we are John and Amber Hanger, and we serve at the High Point Hinsdale location, one of the newest locations. Yes. We see you, Hinsdale. There it is, yes. And one of the many things we love about High Point is the church family that we found here, the yeah. people that we can do the ups and downs of life with, yeah. and all while pointing each other to Jesus. Yeah, we've experienced we both the ups yes. and the downs. All the things. And have had people around us. All the things. Hey, in this series, Life Versus, we're challenging people to choose a life verse for themselves or maybe for a season that is meaningful, that's impactful to you. And one of the verses that's been really meaningful for us is 2 Corinthians 5, 17. I'm going to read it for us. It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away and behold, the new has come. Yeah, and the truth that really speaks to me is the fact that I'm a new creation, yeah. meaning I have a new identity in Jesus, and there's nothing that I've done or that I'm going to do to yeah. make that happen. Yeah, so only especially in a world where your identity is, be you're being told what your identity should be, or you're being reminded of what your past identity was. This is saying, no, 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 there's a, you are a new creation. I mean, we get to hold on to that. It gives us hope as followers of Jesus Christ. Yeah, and it's definitely one of those verses you can't just like hear and then kind of file away and be like, oh great, that's great. But it's, I need to speak it over my life every day yeah. to live in that truth of who I am that in Jesus. Really that's a verse that's been meaningful to us. What's your life verse? All right. Happy New Year. I mean, you guys are the heroes right here. I mean, it's January 2nd. We just had a snowstorm, and here you are. Man, none of you people online right now. I'm not talking about you. They're all sitting at home. You, you're sitting here ready to worship God and get into God's word. And uh, man, I don't know about you, but I'm kind of, anybody ready to see 2021? And let's just lump in 2020 just in the review mirror. You know, I think we said the same thing last year, but we're hoping for 2022, right? But this is the time of the year where, what do we do? We reflect and we think back on, on the year and maybe we begin to think ahead on what are some of the things coming up this year that we'd like to come to see to fruition and just be ready for it. I mean, the next couple of days, you're going to see a lot of Instagram posts that are, you know, new year, new you, right? And like everybody's thinking about, who do I want to be and what do I want to become? And a study a few years ago said uh, that 41% of people write down a New Year's resolution or they write down a list of New Year's resolutions. The same study said that only 9% of those people actually achieve whatever their New Year's resolution was. So those of you that were ambitious yesterday, I know there's a few of you, 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 you got the gym membership, January 1, I'm in. And December is going to come, and you're like, man, I've been paying for that thing all year. I haven't been since April, you know? Or the diets, you know? You're like, okay, 2022, i got to start eating healthy. And then in March, you're going to be like in sunglasses and a hat in the McDonald's drive through so that nobody sees you, right, breaking. We, we do it. Maybe you're a reader, and you're like, i got my 22 books for 2022. And, and then you're gonna, they're going to be very nice paperweights. You know, that end up just sitting, they look nice on the shelf, but man, I didn't get through the books. We all do it, right? We have good intentions and man, I, I have some things I want to leave in the past. There's some new habits I want to pick up in the future. Here's my little hack when it comes, you want to hear my little life hack when it comes to this? Uh, it hasn't disappointed me yet. I just don't write any. And so I have nothing to be disappointed about. At the end of the day, I just don't write any of them down, right? I'm kidding, but here's what I think we're all asking in this time of the year. I think many of us, and, and many of us just throughout the world, we're asking the question, how do I change? Like, I'm not talking about the latest fad or, you know, the latest quick fix. How do I really change who I am? How do I change in the deepest parts of, of my soul what makes me me? How can I be a different version of myself? How can I be me 2.0 or me 3.0? I'm looking for some change. You already heard it, but today we're starting a new series. It's called Life Versus. We're going to go through it this month, take a break, and then we're a two-part series. We're going to do the second part of this series uh, in the spring, where each week we're going to share a great life verse. In fact, our pastors got together and we were sharing what are some of our life verses and what are some of the greatest life verses. I mean, so, so some of you might have a life verse of your own. That's awesome. Maybe you have it hanging in the 
hanging on the wall in your house. Maybe you're like, I don't really think I have something like that. That's all right. Maybe throughout the series, you want to pick up one of these verses or pick a verse during the series that would bring, would bring meaning and encouragement to you. The kind of verse that would come back to mind through a, a difficult time or in a season you're going through and, and God just brings that verse back because you've memorized it and committed it in your heart. Maybe some of you are looking for some some new ink in 2022. These are the perfect tattoo verses, all right? That's what this series is all about. What are the verses so good you'd be willing to tattoo them on your arm? All right, so we're gonna dive in. Today's a power pack verse. You already heard it. If you have a Bible, grab it or open up your phone, open up the High Point app. We're going to 2 Corinthians 5. 2 Corinthians 5, the title of the message is A Brand New You. Where do you find it? Where do I get it? How can I actually change? You heard it, but let me read it one more time. Verse 17, 2 Corinthians 5. Therefore, if anybody is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. It's interesting. You know, it starts with being in Christ. Let's put this first thought up. The new you is only found through one source. There's only one source by which you can find a new version of yourself where real change can take place. It says it right there in the beginning, in Christ. But it's interesting, it starts with, if anyone is in Christ. Meaning what? Meaning some people are not in Christ. How do I know if I'm in Christ? Or, or I'm not in Christ, how do I become in Christ? Well, simply in Christ, uh, we see it 170 times throughout the New Testament, that phrase. It's simply the moment that you choose to turn to Jesus in repentance and faith, that you would confess with your mouth and believe with your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord and you fully surrender your life to him. If that's you and you can point to a time in your life, then that makes you in Christ. It's great news. And you might be wondering, so, so define it for me. What, it, what does it mean to be in Christ? Well, I love it. We're going to skip around in 2 Corinthians 5 because we actually see it in verse 21. Verse 21 says this, for our sake... He made him, that's Jesus, God made Jesus to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Amen. I mean, that's you. Not on your own, don't get it mixed up, but that you, if you're in Christ, because of what Jesus did on the cross, taking all of your sin, putting it on himself, that you can be the righteousness of God. Because he's working in you and he's transforming you. It's where the change comes from. Now, the context of 2 Corinthians 5 is actually one of my favorite areas of the Bible. It's what's called the ministry of reconciliation. And so actually, this whole series of passages in 2 Corinthians 5 is all about reconciliation. Now, the primary application of that is reconciliation to God himself. How can me, a sinful person, God, a holy, perfect God, how can perfection interact with my brokenness, my sinfulness. Well, it's through this verse, through what Jesus did on the cross for you. And it changes everything. Theologians call this substitutionary atonement. It's a switch. It's a trade that he took what you should get and you get from him his righteousness. And so it, this changes how we think, how we speak, how we behave, how we act, it changes, as we're talking about how do we change and experience actual change in life, it changes us because we are now in him. Look at the verses preceding this. It's gonna give us some more insight, starting in verse 14. For the love of Christ controls us. Notice it's the love of Christ. It doesn't just say God controls you. The love of Christ is what controls you, guides you, leads you. How do we find change? Because we have concluded this, that the one has died for all, therefore all have died, and he died for all. That those who live might no longer live for themselves. How do we change? How do we change? How do we change? That we no longer might live for ourselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. So now you see the secondary application here in this ministry and message of reconciliation is that we can actually be reconciled with one another. It's an amazing thing that in human relationship, in a time, although if you look at the history of the world, this is pretty true for all the eras of the world, we're living in a pretty divided time, are we not? There's a lot of division around us. What do we do? How do we make change? How do we make the world better? 
Well, it's the message of reconciliation. That in Christ, reconciliation is possible, but he's the only source. If you're like me, I've spent time in my life looking for other sources of how, how can I find change and how can, I, how can I be a better person? How can I fix this relationship? How can I, do you notice they all start with how can I? Maybe the subtle shift of asking questions like how can I to God will you? God will you help me? God will you guide me? God will you lead me in this? You see, salvation is the starting line. It's not the ending line. Sometimes I, I just want to be I just want to be gentle this morning here on January 2nd. Sometimes we can fall into the trap of going, yeah, yeah, yeah. Steve, I'm, I'm in Christ. I've made that decision. Great. I'm going to heaven. Now let me get back to my life, doing it however I want to do it. You see, the starting line is salvation. And then we begin this race called sanctification that we would look more like Jesus. And we run with perseverance the race that was marked out for us fixing our eyes on Jesus, as Hebrews said. And so we're, we're in this race of God refining us and changing us. I already said it, but it's been a pretty tumultuous year. We've kind of dubbed it here at High Point what's been called a cultural or moral convulsion that's taking place in our world. Where what normally takes maybe a couple decades, our world is changing in two, three, four years. And You've probably watched people in your life, and maybe you're in this position right now, just kind of trying to look for anywhere you can find steady ground and grasping for whatever you can hold on to, searching for truth. It's a time of uncertainty. So what do we do? Well, do you know it's actually in your job description, if you say you're in Christ, that you would bring the world the message of reconciliation. A year ago, as things were just continuing to go kind of wild in our world, we wrote an open letter as a church that we, we put out to the church body and we put online. And it was just an encouragement. It was a way to say, hey, how as Christians do we press in to tumultuous times? I was reading again, we would have released it this week, last year. And here's what it said, and I think it still speaks to us. In a time when many are searching for truth, and many others are simply seeking affirmation of their own opinion or party affiliation. It's our calling as followers of Jesus to return to the source of truth himself. There is a great disruption taking place in the country we all call home and love dearly. The choice alone is ours. Do we enter into the fray of a fractured and broken system or do we bring reform to our hurting land by standing on biblical conviction, by utilizing the whole council of God's word. How do we make change? How do we change? How do we make change in our families? How do we make change in our country? By holding fast to the word of God, by not being pulled into the fray and watching God transform us. The new you, we're talking about how do you find a new you? How, how, how do I actually change? Well, it's not just being in Christ. Let's look, look at the next one. The new you is only possible by one decision. Let's look at the next part of the text in verse 17. Therefore, if anybody's in Christ, he's what? A new creation. Uh, meaning, you can't do it on your own. This isn't going to work out too well, uh, trying to become a new creation on your own. Why? Because we already said it. It said, because you have to be in Christ to become this new creation. The new creation is an outpouring of you being in Christ. It's a byproduct that you now become a new creation. Do you know that the self-help industry, it's an $11.6 billion industry. All the books and all the programs and all the things about how you can go and help yourself. Here's my only thing with this. Like, I'm not an economist or a mathematician, but I'm like, if it was working, like, wouldn't the sales go down? Wouldn't all the people be helped? Right? But this industry, it's a huge industry. And all the self-help books and all the resolutions, all the intentions, all the apps, all the programs, it really can't change you. We want to know why? Because we're really not good at changing ourselves. Amen. And we need to rely on Christ in order to see. Now, I'm not saying, I mean, get disciplined, get focused. I mean, that's awesome. We need those kind of things. But I'm saying real spiritual change, real life change. 
Not saying you can't change the tire on your car or you can't change your dinner plans or you can't, there's some things we can change, but if you don't want to actually change yourself, to be a new version of yourself and how we look and how we behave. But there is a decision. I said it's only possible by one decision. What's the decision? The decision is simply for you to say, and by the way, this is the, the one role you play in this process. God has submitted my life to you. Because if anybody's in Christ, God has submitted my life to you. So the decision you make is to go, God, I'm going to play this game of life by your rules and how you desire for me to live. And guess what? He does all the, God does the heavy lifting. Why? Because this new creation, it, it's a product of the work of what Jesus did on the cross. That as he died and as he rose to life, that you can be risen to a new life in him. It's an amazing reality. Look how powerless the flesh is. No, we're still in 2 Corinthians. This is the verse right before 17, verse 16. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. What's it saying? It's saying you're predominantly a spiritual being more than a physical being. You're predominantly your soul and your personhood and we're going to regard you as a person who's placed their identity in Christ. Identity is a big word in our day and age, is it not? I identify as, I identify with, my identity's in. But this is talking about our identity fully being rooted in Jesus. I said a minute ago, I mean, it's just not possible. We can't just pull ourselves up by our bootstraps and make it happen. I'm just going to muscle my way through this change. Hey, Steve, what do you mean? I mean, I built a pretty successful business. I'm raising a family. I bought a house. Got a I mean, I, I did some things. Yeah, you did. But I'm talking about the difference between success and significance. In this world, yes, you can find some success. I'm not saying you can't do that. You could even find some success on your own from an earthly, worldly standard. What we're talking about here is where you find significance. Significance of who you are. Significance of how God is using you in this world. Significance of how you are going to impact other people. Significance of how you're going to look different in five years, in 10 years, in 20 years as a result of growing in Christ. It's the only way transformation takes place. Romans says it like this in Romans 12, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed. How? 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 That's the thing. That's, the, that's what we're going for, right? Where does the transformation take place? By the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what the will of God is, what is good and acceptable and perfect. That's the target. That's what we're looking for. How do I live a life? This is the transformation I want in my life. I hope it is for you too. How do I live a life in a way that I'm able to discern the good, the acceptable, and the perfect in the world? Well, by the renewing of our mind, that we would think differently, that our worldview would be shifted, that how we engage with the world would be different. Now, for some people, I know nobody in this room, but for some people, they're like, can you answer the question, like, why do I want this new creation thing? I, I kind of like the old stuff. It's a lot of fun. I, I kind of like this way of living. I don't know if you're like me, but I have a family that predominantly our extended family, my extended family on both sides are not followers of Jesus. And so, do you know, they think we're the weird ones. Like they look at us and they're like, all these things you talk about, like freedom and liberty in God, like they see it as like rules and regulations and well, like, go live your life. Why, why are you being so, I kind of like the old way. Why don't I just keep living in the old way? I have a few reasons why I think you want this new creation thing and why I think you want this in Christ. Actually, I have a few more than a few. I have 30. Do you want to hear them? Do you want to hear them? The, the 30 reasons why this new creation thing is so amazing. I'm going to go fast. Hopefully our production people can keep up. Are you ready? 
30 reasons, a new creation. Here's what you are. You are forgiven. You're a child of God. You're having access to God. You've been reconciled to, uh, to God. You've been justified by God, placed in Christ, acceptable to God. You have a heavenly citizenship. You're of the family and the household of God. You're in the fellowship of the saints. You're within the much more care of God. You've been glorified. You have a heavenly association building on the rock that is Christ Jesus, a part in the eternal plan of God. You've been redeemed by God. You have a living relationship with God. Free from the law, you've been adopted. You've been brought near. You want to hear 10 more? Okay. Delivered from the power of darkness. You have entrance into a new kingdom. You have a gift from God, the Father, to God. Christ. You're members of a royal and holy priesthood, a chosen generation, a holy nation, a peculiar people. Yes, you are. His inheritance, light in the world, unified to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, complete in him, possessing every spiritual blessing. That's why you might want to choose this new creation. Because this new creation, you know, it's not a one and done thing. This new creation is that God is making you new over and over and over again. He does the work. He's making you new. Your job is to receive. And those are some great benefits that you have as a new creation. Here's how C.S. Lewis talks about this. He says, God became man to turn creatures into sons and daughters, not simply to produce better men of the old kind, but to produce a whole new kind of man and woman. See, Jesus has a plan for you. God has a plan for you, and it looks totally different than the old way of living. It's a totally different paradigm. It's a different way of living, and it's one that's modeled after how Jesus lived his life. And good thing, we have a book that shows us exactly how Jesus lived his life. Let me give you two more. This new you, this change you're trying to see, the new you is only revealed by one indicator. I like metrics. I, I like, who's, who are my like spreadsheet people in the room? Who are the people that are like, show me the results. Is this thing working? Like, show me the bottom line. Show me the numbers. I, I don't just want to just, is this change actually happening? Well, we actually have an indicator. We actually have a, a metric of if life transformation is taking place. We see it in the next phrase in verse 17. The old has passed away. How do we know if the new is being made new in a new creation? Well, it answers itself that the old things of life will begin to pass away. That the old way of living and thinking will not be the same way I'm going to live and think down the road as I'm maturing in Christ. Now, oh, Steve, are you saying then this new creation, we no longer sin anymore? That sounds pretty good. We don't make mistakes anymore. No, I'm not saying that. It's not saying that we don't make mistakes. It's not saying we don't have sin. But it is saying that, that the old passing away is proof of you being a new creation. That you're going to look different. And no, for all of you who raised your hands, it's not all up and to the right. Yeah, you're going to have some setbacks. Yeah, you're going to have some difficulty along the way. But that you are fixing your eyes on Jesus, like we said in Hebrews, and you are growing in him. We used to say it like this all the time at High Point, that if your faith hasn't changed you, it probably hasn't saved you. If your faith hasn't changed you, your faith in Jesus isn't changing your life, it probably has not saved you. Because the math is pretty simple. How can I be living in this new reality if I'm simultaneously living in this old way of living? It's incompatible. If your faith hasn't changed you, it hasn't saved you. At High Point, we have growth groups. And I hope you've experienced a growth group group before. If you haven't, they kick off in two weeks and you can get signed up. You can go online to get in a group. And it's our primary place for discipleship and care. Hey, hey I want to change more. I want to look more like Jesus. How, how do I grow in my discipleship? Hey, I got some needs. I got some difficulty I'm going through. I need some people and community in my life. Where, where do I find that? Well, in a growth group. It's actually the, the secret sauce of what we do here at High Point. It, it, more so than even these weekend services, it's getting together in community where you can experience having other people come alongside you. One of those groups is called Hope Groups. It's an amazing group. Uh, we just rewrote the entire curriculum this past year. And Hope Groups are for those that are going through some difficulty in their life and they need hope. 
Maybe it's grieving. Maybe if it's a relational conflict or a substance issue or you're trying to find victory over an area of sin. And in our hope groups, we have this teaching actually right from 2 Corinthians 5 that has this reality in it. That this old passing away is actually all about your new identity in Jesus. That actually we can't find our identity in any other thing other than Jesus if you want to experience this kind of change. And before we just jump past that and we're like, yeah, yeah, I'm totally, my identity is fully in Christ. As fallen people, the reality is that I'm guilty just as anybody else's. That we begin, if we're not careful, to find our identity in other things. I don't know what it is for you. Maybe it's the job that you have and I'm this. Isn't it interesting that as People, what do we ask? Hey, we meet somebody new for the, hey, what do you do? We just assume, what is your job? I do a lot more things other than my job, and I am a lot more things other than my job. But we can find our identity in our job. We could find our identity in a spouse or a relationship. We could find our identity in kids. We could find our identity in uh, I'm the athlete or I'm the artist. And this is a call to say there's so many lies that we believe when it comes to our own identity. And that if you want the new you, it's going to be a recalibration of your identity to be fully rooted, 100%. I only find my identity in Christ alone. It defines who I am. It tells me who I am. It's an outpouring of who I am. Let me share these five lies. Remember, this is the old that needs to pass away. What needs to pass away? Well, some of these lies need to pass away. The first one is I am what I have. This is a popular one today. This is the identity lie of possessions. The sum total of your worth is what you possess. And the more I get and the bigger the house and the more I have and the nicer the things. And by the way, things are not bad. We just shouldn't shouldn't find our identity in them. And so I am what I have. Look how successful, look what I, here's another one. I am what I do. This is the identity lie of performance. Uh, Who I am is what I do and accomplish. Man, I I checked this off and I got that done and I closed that deal and I made this event happen. But we start to find our identity in the things that we accomplish versus who we are in Christ. Here's the third one. I am what other people say or think of me. And I just want to be sensitive. I know if you've struggled with this one and you've had that, that little person, the enemy speaking, whispering into your ear, particularly if you're a people pleaser in this room or joining us online today, this is a hard one. But it's where the enemy wants to whisper into your ear a lie. It's the identity lie of people pleasing. I live for the affirmation and the approval of others. And by the way, affirmation, approval, uh, uh, that's great. Everybody wants that. It's if I need that to be a part of my identity. Because do you know that Jesus accepts you and approves of you just as you are? That's why I went to the cross. Do you know that through this message of reconciliation, we should accept one another for who you are? Not to say, stay the same, never change. But hey, welcome into the family of God. Let's go on this journey of changing and finding our identity fully rooted in Christ together. Here's two more. They kind of are the reverse of each other. I'm nothing more than my worst moment. This is the identity lie of past regret. I'm a slave to my past and I keep reliving it. That, that moment, that choice you made, that thing that hurt somebody, that, that, that one thing I wish that I could just take back and I'm just playing the game tape over and over and over again the worst moment of my life. And I, I, I just can't break free of it, but your identity in Christ allows you to break free. It, it might be a hurdle for you. It might be a hurdle for other people in your life. I can tell you it's not a hurdle for God. But then the flip side can happen as well is that I'm nothing less than my best moment. And this is the identity lie of pride. Hey, I don't need to address my weaknesses. I don't need to address my faults. Look at what I've done. Look at all that I've accomplished. But that's equally a lie and a trap that we fall into. This one's about pride. I, I, I'm going to do it my own way. I'm going to make my own way. I don't know which one of these maybe resonates with you today. 
And there's probably some other ones that we could have added to the list. But is just asking your heart of hearts. You don't have to tell anybody around you. Is there any part of your life where the reality is I'm finding a piece of my identity in something I do or something people say or a moment of my life versus saying 100% of my life is finding my identity in Christ alone? Because God says you're a new creation. And in him, you can find your identity. These things, man, they're, they're dangerous lies. They're self-focused. They, these lies get us on the rat race of life where we're just trying, every moment, we're just trying to keep up and get to the next moment or the next thing. They lead to exhaustion. They lead to, lead to great discouragement. Okay, so if I'm a new creation, tell me what my identity then looks like in Christ. Okay, here's what it is. My identity is decided by embracing Jesus, we already talked about that, it's declared by displacing my old self, and it's determined by replacing my old self with a whole new me. Now that's some good news. Simple to understand, and at times can be hard to do. Here's one final way if you're looking to change here in 2022, real change, is that the new you is only sustained by one faith. That this new you, it's not going to be sustained on your own. I, I can promise you it requires a, a rooted faith, this new creation. You know, it's been popular in the last 10 years or so that there's some people that decide, they're like, yeah, I'm all for the Jesus thing, but I'm out on, this, I'm out on the church and I'm out on the, the, the family of God and it's just going to be me and Jesus and my Bible and we're going to go do our own thing. Well, can I tell you, kind of tongue in cheek, if you actually read that Bible, it would tell you that you need community and you need people and you need the family of God and you need the church, the, the God-given institution that he created for life transformation. It's not going to happen on our own. You need people and community surrounding you, relationships that are encouraging you and challenging you in your discipleship. You know, we all just celebrated Christmas, right? Right? Who likes new things? I'm not afraid to admit it. I like some new things from time to time, right? Maybe you got some at Christmas. You know, you got like the new pair of kicks, some great new shoes. And if they're really nice shoes, they come, they come in their own individual bag inside the box. I mean, that's when you know somebody bought you some real nice shoes that bagged up individually. Or, or you got a new coat. I mean, snow is here. And get, get the wardrobe ready for, for winter and... Maybe you got like, does this actually happen? Do you guys remember, do you guys remember these Lexus commercials? The big, the big red bow that would be like on top of the car in the driveway. Who gets a car for Christmas? Does this actually happen? I mean, I grew up in the wrong family if this happens, you know? It's like this perfect idyllic moment with the snow and the big bow. And here's the thing about new things, as much as I enjoy them from time to time. How long does it take? A month? couple of weeks, all of a sudden the shoes got the scuff on it, the jacket's got the rip, the new car's got the dent on it. They're like, oh, that didn't last very long. They're depreciating assets, I could say, all of those things, right? Uh, but this relationship, this newness in Christ, it's the only thing that it appreciates more and more and more and more over time. Isn't it true that in our life, I mean, there's very few things, most things in life start from new and they move to old. It's just the nature of how it works. A baby being born, growing up, I know we like to not admit it, but we're all getting a little bit older. And then we get older and then we get older. The things we buy, we buy them new, then they get older. This new paradigm, this new creation, just like Jesus, it's upside down. Do you see that in verse 17? That Jesus is in the business of taking the old, broken, ratty things of this world. I'm really sorry, but that's you and me in this. And making them new again. Uh, I mean, it's an amazing, amazing thing. That Jesus is actually, he's kind of like in the salvage and restoration business. That's what he's doing. And he's going to continue to make you new. 
And as you grow in this newness of Christ, I can guarantee you a few things. The depth of your relationship with him is going to grow. Your understanding of his character and conduct is going to grow. Your intimacy and ability to hear his voice as we discern his will, like we read earlier, it's going to grow. The richness by which you are transformed within is going to grow. There is no end to you becoming a new creation in Christ. Here's what Warren Wearsby says about this change we're talking about. He says, nothing paralyzes our lives like the attitude that things can never change. We need to remind ourselves that God can change things. Outlook determines outcome. If we see only the problems, we will be defeated. But if we see the possibilities in problems, we can have victory. The outlook determines the outcome. And the outlook of a person in Christ, being made a new creation, allowing the old to fade away, is going to produce a totally different outcome in your life. As we close today, on the way in, you received some communion elements. If you have those, I'd ask that you grab them now. If you didn't get them, it's okay. You can get up out of your seat. And there's some stations at the back. Some of our ushers will be walking up. If you're joining us online right now, we're going to participate in communion in just a moment. You might want to hit pause or head to your kitchen and just maybe grab some bread or cracker or juice or even water, something that could represent the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. So you too at home can participate with us. And as we close our time together, we've we've carved out some extra space in our service. Some extra time to slow down. That sounds like a good way to start 2022. Before we get back to the pace of life, that you can spend some time right now to meet with God. Communions for those who have turned to Jesus in repentance and faith. And that... That bread represents the body of Jesus that was broken for you that allows you to be a new creation today. And that juice represents the blood of Jesus that was shed on your behalf that took your sins upon him. All I'd ask is as we close out a year and enter a new year, would you take some time to reflect on some things and maybe there's some things that you want to leave in the past in 2021. The beautiful thing is you can just lay those at the foot of the cross. Maybe there's some new goals and habits and spiritual growth that you want to experience in this new year. Would this be a time for you to pray and reflect and listen to the voice of God? We're not going to take the elements together. This time is yours and the worship team is going to begin to sing over us. Take some time. Meet with God. You can sit, you can stand, you can pray, you can kneel. When you feel like you've heard from God, take those elements. And then when you're ready, you can stand and sing with us.